Well, good morning. Uh, last week, we looked at the question, what sort of Redeemer is needed to bring us back to God? And the answer to that was one who is fully human and one who is fully God. So not 50% human, 50% God, um, or some combination, but fully human and fully God. And in that recognizing that many church heresies around the person of Christ and even the religions of our day, their belief about Christ tends to emphasize one of these two things to, at the expense of the other. So they may say he is divine and deity, but not fully human, or they may say he is fully human and go so far as to say, in fact, he's a creation of God and is not God himself. And so we see that there is uh, heresy around this and, and wrong belief and wrong doctrine around this. And as we said last week, this week and next, we're going to look at each side of, of that. Why must the Redeemer mu be truly human and why must he be truly God? So this week, question 22, why must the Redeemer be truly human? That in human nature, he might on our behalf perfectly obey the whole law and suffer the punishment for human sin, and also that he might sympathize with our weaknesses. Hebrews 2.17 is our memory passage, and it says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of of the people. Our answer to this question and, and what we'll consider is that there are several aspects as to why Christ must be fully human. Part of that is, as the answer suggests, he had to obey the law on our behalf. He did what we couldn't do and so is our representative before God. And also there is an element that, that gives us comfort in the midst of struggle and trial and temptation because he can sympathize with our weaknesses. One of the passages that, that often comes up in regards to Christ's humanity and his deity is Philippians 2, and this idea that Christ emptied himself. We're going to save that passage for next week. And so this week we're going to consider a few reasons as to why the Redeemer, why Christ had to be truly and fully human. One, he had to be born under the law. Consider Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. It says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoptions as sons. So he had to be one under the law, born under the law, so that he could redeem those who were under the law. And so he had to be fully human, experiencing the temptations and the trials that we experience so that he might be our Redeemer. Uh, he had to, as we've already noted, be our representative in terms of perfectly obeying the law. There are a few passages that get at this idea. One is Christ's temptation. Um, in Christ's temptation, I, I think he... As the, as the devil comes and tempts, Christ responds with certain scripture passages, and I think those passages are intentional as he is identifying with Israel. And he's saying what Israel was supposed to do and how Israel was supposed to behave, but didn't, they failed. Christ comes in and says, I have come to fulfill and succeed what they failed to obey. And so Christ comes to be our representative. Romans 5 gets at this further, where it says, uh, through one man sin entered the world, and says, so also through the obedience of one man, we might all be forgiven. And so he, on our behalf, obeys the law perfectly and completely, so that we might be like him. Hebrews 2, as we've already read in our me memory passage this morning, says, for surely it is not angels that he helps. This is starting back in verse 16. Surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. He helps humankind. Therefore, 
he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. But hear this again. In order to be and to make a propitiation, a sacrifice for the sins of the people, he had to be made like them in every respect. To be merciful, to be the faithful high priest that he is, he had to be like us in every respect. And so he had to be fully human in order that he might make propitiation and be our representative in terms of obedience to the law. And then Hebrews 4 continues this idea. Hebrews 4.15 says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, the author of Hebrews doesn't appeal to Christ's deity for our comfort. He doesn't appeal to his divine nature as the second person of the Trinity. No, the author of Hebrews appeals to Christ's humanity. Right? He says, he is in every respect tempted as we are, yet without sin. That part's important for him to be our representative as obedient to the law. But it's, it's his weaknesses. It's his humanity that, that the author of Hebrews points to as the encouragement for us to draw near. Because Christ was fully human and suffered and was tempted as we are, we can draw near to the throne of grace with confidence to find mercy and grace to help in our time of need. Our Redeemer had to be fully human so that he could be our representative. But on top of that, him being fully human also means he can empathize and understands our weakness and our sorrow and our struggle. And so we need him to be fully human, otherwise he is distant from us. Along with being our hope for the struggle and the trial, Christ is our example. Consider 1 John 2.6. It says, Whoever says he abides in him, that is Christ, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. You see, throughout Scripture, and the New Testament very specifically, we are told to be like Christ. Ephesians 4, when we talk about a lot about equipping the saints for the work of ministry, the goal of that, the end of that ministry, is to be mature to the measure of Christ. We are to be like Christ. Um, Hebrews says we are to fix our eyes on him, the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the one we are to emulate, to be like, to model our lives after. The Spirit does the work of transformation as we behold Christ. As we look to Him, we are transformed from one degree of glory to the next, but we are transformed from how we are to be more like Christ. And as we look to Him as the author and perfecter of our faith, He enables us to lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely. So we follow him as our example. And it gets back to something we've talked about throughout this series of this idea that we submit to Christ as Lord and Savior. He is Savior because he is fully human and our representative. And he is Lord because we submit ourselves to him, to his example. And he is a kind and gracious Lord who can empathize because he has experienced weakness, trial, temptation, and suffering just as we have. So that we can draw near to the throne of grace to find mercy and help in our time of need. The fact that Christ is fully human is necessary and also a great comfort as we live and struggle day to day. But we have hope because of who he is and what he has done.